Good evening, boys and girls. Are you ready for a story? My word, you're in for a treat. I can't count how many stories I've put back to back, but we've got Zog, Tabby McTat, The Highway Rat, The Ugly Five, The Singing Mermaid, The Rhyming Rabbit, Tiddler, The Gruffalo's Child, and one of my favourites, Paper Dolls. All by the amazing and wonderful Julia Donaldson. I hope you enjoy, and I hope you remember to hit the subscribe button, share with a friend, and close your eyes as you listen to all these amazing stories. Hope you enjoy. This episode is dedicated to all my listeners in the United States of America. You're probably listening on Spotify or iTunes. Love you guys. Hope you're staying well. Let's go. Once upon a time. Zog. Madam Dragon ran a school many moons ago. She taught young dragons all the things the dragons need to know. Zog, the biggest dragon, was the keenest one by far. He tried his hardest every day to win the golden star. All the dragons in year one were learning how to fly. Hi, said Madam Dragon, way up in the sky. Now that you've been shown, you can practice on your own, and you'll all be expert flyers by the time you're fully grown. So, Zog went off to practice, flying fast and free. He soared and swooped and looped the loop, then crashed into a tree. Just then, a little girl came by. Oh, please don't cry, she said. Perhaps you'd like a nice sticky plaster for your head. What a good idea, said Zog. Then up and off he flew, his plaster gleaming pinkly as he zigzagged through the blue. A year went by, and in year two the dragons learned to roar. More, said Madam Dragon. Louder, I implore. Now that you've been shown, you can practice on your own, and you'll be champion roarers by the time you're fully grown. So, Zog went off to practice. He roared with fearsome force. He kept it up for hours on end, but then his throat grew hoarse. Just then, the girl came by again. She said, what rotten luck. Perhaps you'd like a nice soothing peppermint to suck. What a good idea, said Zog. Then up and off he flew, and breathing fumes and peppermint, he zigzagged through the blue. A year went by, and in year three, the dragons learned to blow. No, said Madam Dragon, breathe out fire, not snow. Now that you've been shown, you can practice on your own, and you'll all be breathing bonfires by the time you're fully grown. So, Zog went off to practice. He blew with all his might. He twirled around in triumph, and his wing tip caught a light. Ow! Just then, the girl came by again. She said, you poor old thing, perhaps you'd like a nice stretchy bandage for your wing. What a good idea, said Zog, and then up and off he flew, his bandage flapping wildly as he zigzagged through the blue. All the year four dragons were learning, can you guess? Yes, said Madam Dragon, how to capture a princess. Now that you've been shown, you can practice on your own. You'll need to capture hundreds by the time you're fully grown. Zog went off to practice. He tried and tried and tried, but he simply couldn't manage. I'm no good at this, he cried. I'll never win a golden star. Just then he saw the girl. Perhaps, she said, you'd like to capture me. I'm Princess Pearl. What a good idea, said Zog. Then up and off they flew, the princess gripping tightly as they zigzagged through the blue. Ah, said Madam Dragon, our first princess so far. Congratulations, Zog, my dear, you've won a golden star. 
Zog was proud and happy, and Pearl felt good as well. She took the dragon's temperatures and nursed them when they fell. A year went by, and in year five, the dragons learned to fight. Right, said Madame Dragon, here comes a real-life knight. Up spoke the knight. My name, he said, is Gadabout the Great. I've come to rescue Princess Pearl. I hope I'm not too late. Zag breathed fire and beat his wings. You can't, she's mine, he roared. Oh, no, she's not, yelled Gadabout, and waved his trusty sword. The other, the, the other dragons crowded round and watched them all, all agog. Who was going to win the fight, Sagadabout or Zog? Then Princess Pearl stepped forward, crying, Stop, you silly chumps. The world's already far too full of cuts and bumps, cuts and bums and bumps. <laughs> Don't rescue me, I won't go back to being a princess and prancing round the palace in a silly frilly dress. I want to be a doctor and travel here and there, listening to people's chests and giving them my care. Me too, exclaimed the knight, and took his helmet off his head. I'd rather wear a nice twisty stethoscope, he said. Perhaps, princess, you'll train me up. And Pearl replied, of course, but I don't see how the two of us could fit upon your horse. Then Zog said, Flying doctors, I'd love to join the crew. If you'll let me be your ambulance, then I can carry you. Bravo, said Madam Dragon. An excellent career. And all your five dragons gave a loud and rounding cheer. Then Madam Dragon told the horse, I really hope you'll stay. I'll let you be my pupil's pet and feed you lots of hay. What a good idea, said Zog. Then up and off he flew, the flying doctors waving as they zigzagged through the blue. The end. Tabby McTat Tabby McTat was a busker's cat, with a meow that was loud and strong. The two of them sang of this and that, and people threw coins into the old checkered hat, and this was their favourite song. Me, you, and the old guitar, how perfectly, perfectly happy we are. Me, you, and the old guitar, how perfectly happy we are. One morning, while Fred ate some bacon and bread, McTat took a stroll round the block, then stopped, for there, on a doorstep, sat a gorgeously glossy and green-eyed cat. She was black with one snowy white sock. Sock and McTat had a cat-to-cat chat, and that's how their story began, for while they were chatting of this and of that, a thief had his eye on the old checkered hat. He eyed it, he snatched it, he ran. The busker gave chase, but he tripped on a lace, and crash, in a flash, he was down. He broke his leg and banged his head, and ended up in a hospital bed in a faraway part of town. Goodbye, McTat said. I must get back to Fred. But where had the busker gone? The sun went down, and the sky grew black. The stars came out, but he didn't come back. McTat lingered on and on. A week later, Suck took a stroll around the block and found her new friend looking thin. He's gone off and left me, said Tabby McTat. Then Sock said, Many people, my people, Prunella and Pat, would gladly find room for a fine Tabby Cat. She was right, and they took McTat in. Next morning, old Fred left his hospital bed and found his way back to the square. But the brass band stood where the pair once sat, and the band played this and the band played that. And Fred looked all round for his loud meowed cat, but Tabby McTat wasn't there. Now McTat had a wife and a very full life with plenty of things to do, like washing Prunella and pouncing on Pat, and hiding the car keys under the mat, and keeping the newspaper nice and flat, and giving the pens an occasional bat, and nibbling this and nibbling that. But he dreamed of his friend in the old checkered hat, 
and always woke up with a meow. And often he said, what's happened to Fred? And his paws took him back to the square. But a conjurer stood where the pair once sat. And he pulled out this and he pulled out that. And people threw coins into the tall black hat. But the busker was never there. One morning, Sock said, Look under your bed and see three kittens I've had. And Soames looked like this and Susan looked like that. And the little kittens called Samuel Spratt. Looked exactly the same as his dad. The three kittens grew and they learned how to meow. And McTat sometimes sang them his song. And Samuel Spratt with his tabby grey fur had a deafening meow and a very loud purr. And he simply loved singing along. Meow on the old guitar, how perfectly perfect happy we are. Meow on the old guitar, how perfectly happy we are. When Susan and Soames found a very good home, their parents were happy and proud. There was one home like this and another like that. But nobody wanted poor Samuel Spratt. They all said, his voice is too loud. Now Tabby McTat was a home-loving cat, but he couldn't stop dreaming of Fred. And one day he called for his wife and his son and told them, There's something that has to be done. I must go and find him, he said. So up and down and all over town, he wandered a whole week long. For many a morning and afternoon, by the light of the sun and the light of the moon, till he heard a familiar song. Just me and the old guitar. If I had a cat, I'd be happier by far. Just me and the old guitar. With my cat, I'd be happier by far. Is Tabby McTat? It's my long lost cat. Old Fred was as, was ecstatically glad. Then the two of them sang of this and that, and people threw coins in the new checkered hat. But why did McTat feel sad? He was missing his wife and his comfortable life and the dozens of things to do, like washing Prunella and pouncing on Pat and hiding the car keys under the mat, keeping the newspaper nice and flat, giving the pens an occasional bat. But now, could he tell the busker that? Then out from the shadows sprang Samuel Splat. Oh, please let me be the busker's cat, he said with his deafening meow. Now Samuel Spratt is the busker's cat with a meow that's loud and strong. The two of them sing of this and that, though Samuel sings just a little bit flat, and people throw coins into the old checkered hat. And this is a favourite song. Me, you, the old guitar, how perfectly, perfectly happy we are. Me, oh, the old guitar, how perfectly happy we are. The end. The Highway Rat The Highway Rat was a baddie. The Highway Rat was a beast. He took what he wanted and ate what he took. His life was one long feast. His teeth were sharp and yellow. His manners were rough and rude. And the Highway Rat went riding, 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 riding along the highway and stealing the traveller's food. A rabbit came hopping along the road and stopped with a paw in the air. But blocking away was a highway rat who cried, Who goes there? Give me your pastries and puddings. Give me your chocolate and cake. For I am the rat of the highway. The highway. The highway. Yes, I am the rat of the highway. And, I, and whatever I want, I take. I have no cakes, the rabbit replied. I just have a bunch of clover. The highway rat gave a scornful look, but he ordered, Hand it over. This clover is bound to be tasteless. This clover is dull as can be. But I am the rat of the highway, and this clover belongs to me. A squirrel came bounding along the road, then stopped with a shake and a shiver. For reining his horse was the highway rat, who thundered, Stand and deliver! 
Give me your buns and your biscuits. Give me your chocolate eclairs. For I am the rat of the highway, the highway, the highway. Yes, I am the rat of the highway, and the rat thief never shares. I have no buns, the squirrel replied. I just have a sack of nuts. The robber snatched the sack and snarled. I'll have no ifs and buts. These nuts are probably rotten. These nuts are as hard as can be. But I am the rat of the highway, and these nuts belong to me. Some ants came crawling along the road and stopped with a somersault. For baring his teeth was a highway rat who bellowed a deafening, Halt! Give me your sweets and your lollies. Give me your toffees and chews. For I am the rat of the highway, the highway, the highway. Yes, I am the rat of the highway, and nobody dares to refuse. We have no sweets, the ants replied. We just have this nice green leaf. Oh, no, you don't. Not any more, declared the highway thief. This leaf is nasty and bitter. This leaf is as thin as can be. But I am the rat of the highway, and this leaf belongs to me. You've never pleased our thank you. The rat carried on his way. Please, Miss Lady, make them a pet. What stories in our house have told? The creatures who travel the highway grew thinner and thinner and thinner, while the highway rat grew horribly fat from eating up everyone's dinner. The duck came wandering down the road and stopped with a, How do you do? I see you have nothing. The rat complained. In that case, I'll just eat you. I doubt if you're terribly juicy. Most likely you're as tough as can be. But I am the rat of the highway. The highway. The highway. Yes, I am the rat of the highway. And I fancy a duck for tea. Hang on, quacked the duck. For I have a sister with goodies you might prefer. I know that she'd love to meet you. And I'm certain that you'd like her. For in her cave, her deep dark cave, right at the top of the hill, are biscuits and buns are plenty, and there you may eat your fill. Lead on, cried the rat, and they took to the road which seemed it would never end. Onwards they rode and upwards, bend after bend after bend. At last they came to a lonely cave, and the duck began to quack. She quacked, Good evening, sister, sister. Sister, and sister, sister, a voice from the cave came back. Do you have cakes and chocolates? The highway robber cried. And chocolates, 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 the voice from the came repl cave replied. I'm coming to take them, the highway thief yelled. His greedy eyes grew round. And take them, take them, take them, came back the welcome sound. The highway rat leapt off his horse into the cave he strode. The duck took hold of the horse's reins and galloped down the road, faster and ever faster, following all the bends. The plucky young duck went riding, 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 galloping down the highway back to her hungry friends. Then they shared out the food from the saddle bags and feasted all night long. Bright were the flames of the bonfire, loud was the music and song. Wild was the moonlight dancing, merry the cheer and chat. For now they could live in freedom, safe from the highway rat. And as for the rat and the echoey king, he shouted and wondered too. He found his way out of the darkness, and he ever seemed to appear. A thinner and greyer and weaker rat who robs on the road no more. For he landed a job in a cake shop. A cake shop. Yes, a cake shop. And they say he still works in the cake shop, sweeping the cake shop floor. The end. The Ugly Five Morning had dawned and yet again plain. The lion lay grinning at his glorious mane. 
The kudu looked cool and the rana looked fine. The bright pink flamingo looked simple divine. The zebra looked graceful. The leopard looked great. Oh, what a picture of beauty. But wait. Who is this creature so ugly and weird with a spindly legs and a gingery beard with a big chunky chest and a skinny behind? To say she looks plain would be really quite kind. It's the wildebeest. Slowly she ambled along, trampling the grass and singing this song. I am the ugly one, I am the ugly one. I am the ugliest animal under the sun. My ungainly appearance is second to none. I am the ugly one, the ugly one, the ugly one. But here's someone uglier ever than me. Who can this strange looking specimen be? How do you do? I'm the spotted hyena. Who could be ugly? Who could look meaner? My mane is all spiky. My skin is all spotty. No other creature could look quite so grotty. My voice is a mixture of giggles and groans. And I like nothing better than crunching on bones. I must be the ugliest beast in the scrub. Then the wheel of the be- then the wildebeest shouted, "Hooray! Join the club!" The two ugly animals ambled along, kicking the dust up and singing this song: "We're the ugly two. We're the ugly two. We wouldn't win a prize for beauty. It's true. You'll see nothing worse if you go to the zoo. We're the ugly two. We're the ugly two." But who is this hideous bird we can see, perched on a branch of the powder puff tree? I am the leopard-faced vulture. I am ugly and bald. No wonder that everyone looks so appalled. I have flaps on my face that are wrinkled and pink. My beak is gigantic and what's more, I stink. At mealtimes my habits are really quite vile. I much prefer food that's been dead for a while. I'm clearly a lot more revolting than you. Then the other two shouted. Bravo, bravo, join the crew. The three ugly animals ambled along, splashing through water and singing this song. We are the ugly three. We are the ugly three. The ugliest beasts that you're likely to see. You wouldn't be tempted to ask us for tea. We are the ugly three. We are the ugly three. But who is this animal having a role in the bubbling mud of the watering hole? Hello, I'm the warthog, as ugly as sin, with two pairs of tusks and a brisky chin. My tail stands on end and my body is dumpy. My head is too big and my skin is too lumpy. People are shocked by my deafening snorts and my face that is covered in horrible warts. I'm the worst looking creature from the hero to Japan. Then the other three shouted, Yippee, join the clan. The four ugly animals ambled along, scaring the starlings and singing this song. We are the ugly four. We are the ugly four. We're grisly and gruesome and hard to ignore. Just take one look and your eyes will be sore. We are the ugly four. We are the ugly four. But who is this perfectly terrible frump raiding the rubbish bins down by the dump? I am the marble stalk and I think you'll agree that no other bird looks as dreadful as me. My wings are enormous and I'm hunched and I'm gangly and then look at my throat pouch, it's all dingly dangly. My legs long and skinny are covered in poo, and I'll eat almost anything, even a shoe. I'm grouchy, old grump, and I'm a horrible slob. Then the other four shouted, Yahoo! Join the mob! So the five ugly animals ambled along, casting long shadows and singing this song. We are the ugly five. We are the ugly five. Everyone flees, and when they see us arrive, How can such hideous creatures survive? We are the ugly five. But stop. Just wait a minute. Be quiet. Who are these?
peeping from burrows and hiding from trees. Hello, we are your babies. Give us our food and help cheer up when we're in a bad mood. You clean us and preen us and pick out the nits. And we want you to know that we love you to bits. We love you all, your spots and your warts, and your bristles and your grunts, and your groans and your hoots, and your whistles. We really don't think you look ugly at all. Your beauties, your bombshells, the bells of the ball. You're kind and you're cuddly, and you're brave and you're strong, and that is our reason for singing this song. You are the lovely five. You are the lovely five. You're sweeter than honey from bees in a hive. You're quite the most beautiful creatures of life. You are the lovely five. You are the lovely five. The end. Good evening, my little scientists, my little explorers and inventors. How are you doing tonight? Are you ready for bed? Are you ready for a bedtime story? This story is called The Singing Mermaid by Julia Donaldson and Lydia Monks. As you listen, I want you to think about why Old Man Sly was such a bad guy. Once upon a time, did you ever go to Silver Sands on a sunny summer's day then perhaps you saw the mermaid who sang in the deep blue bay. She sang to the fish in the ocean, to the haddock, the hake and the ling, and they flashed their scales and swished their tails to hear the mermaid sing. And sometimes the singing mermaid swam to the silvery shore. She sat and combed her golden hair, and then she sang some more. She sang to the cockles and the mussels. She sang to the birds on the wing. And the seashells clapped and the seagulls flapped to hear the mermaid sing. When Sam Sly's circus came to town, Sam took a stroll by the sea. He heard the mermaid singing and he rubbed his hands with glee. He said, I can make you famous. I can make you rich, he said. You shall swim in a pool of marble and asleep on a fine feather bed. You shall sing for the lords and the ladies. You shall sing for the queen and the king. And young and old will pay good gold to hear the mermaids sing. Don't go! Don't go! cried the seagulls. And the seashells warned, He lies! But the mermaid listened to old Sam Sly and smiled as she waved goodbye. And he took her away to the circus and she sang to the crowds round the ring. And more, more, more came the deafening roar when they heard the mermaid sing. Now the mermaid shared a caravan with Annie the acrobat, and Ding and Dong the circus dogs, and Bella the circus cat. And she made good friends with the jugglers, and the man who swallowed fire, and the clown with the tumble-down trousers, and the woman who walked on wire. But she wasn't friends with old Sam Sly. No, she didn't care for him, for he made her live in a fish tank where there wasn't room to swim. And there was no pool of marble. There was no fine feather bed. And when she begged him, set me free, he laughed and shook his head. All summer long, the circus toured, all autumn, winter, spring, and many a crowd cheered long and loud, to hear the mermaid sing. But the mermaid dreamed of silver sands, and she longed for the deep blue sea, and her songs grew sad, and again she said, I beg you to set me free. But again he laughed and shook his head, and he told her, No such thing. Here you'll stay while people pay to hear the mermaid sing. At silver sands, a seagull was flying to his nest, when on the breeze he heard a song, the song which he loved best. And he followed the song to the caravan. Sam Sly was about to lock it. The seagull watched as he turned the key and slipped it inside his pocket. The seagull waited till Sam had gone. Then he perched on the window sill and tap, tap, tap at the window 
He tapped with his yellow bill. Come back, come back to Silver Sands. It's only a mile away. I can find the key and set you free if you come back home to the bay. Escape, barked the dogs. Escape, meowed the cats. But the mermaid sighed. I'd fail, for how could I walk to Silver Sands when I only have a tail? Like this, cried Annie the acrobat, and she stood upon her hands. This is the way, the only way to get to Silver Sands. Right hand, left hand, tail up high. There's really nothing to it. If I give you lessons every night, you'll soon learn how to do it. The next week, while Sam was snoring, the seagull stole the key. He carried it off to the caravan and set the mermaid free. And he flew ahead to guide her as she walked upon her hands all along the moonlit road that led to Silver Sands. And the creatures on the seashore and the fish beneath the foam jumped and splashed and danced with joy to have the mermaid home. And she sang to the cockles and the mussels, she sang to the birds on the wing, and the seashells clapped and the seagulls flapped to hear the mermaid sing. And if you go down to Silver Sands and swim in the Bay of Blue, perhaps you'll see the mermaid, and perhaps she'll sing for you. The End The Rhyming Rabbit Once upon a time there was a rhyming rabbit. The rhyming rabbit was sitting with his family in a grassy field. All the other rabbits were eating the grass, but the rhyming rabbit was making up a poem about it. Grass is growing all around. It makes a lovely swishing sound. It looks so green. It smells so sweet. And best of all, it's good to eat. Stop rhyming. Start eating, said the other rabbits. It was beginning to get dark when one of the rabbits pricked up its ears and stamped a foot. Fox! he shouted. Straight away, all the other rabbits ran to their burrow, all except the rhyming rabbit, who closed his eyes and made up a poem about the fox. Oh, fearful fox, all rusty red, you'll find our rabbit's hearts with dread. So silently you crouch and sniff until you catch our rabbit's whiff. So hungrily, you cunning beast, you stalk your tasty rabbit feast. You're sly and crafty through and through, but we can run as fast as you. Don't rhyme! Run! yelled the other rabbits. The rhyming rabbit opened his eyes, saw the fox, and ran. He reached the burrow just in time before the fox gobbled him up. It was night time, and the tired rabbits lay down together in their burrow, all except the rhyming rabbit, who sat apart from the others, singing a song to them. Sleep, rabbit, sleep, snuggle up and close your eyes, and listen to my lullabies. Sleep, rabbit, sleep. Dream, rabbits, dream of grassy fields and sunny hours, and cabbages and cauliflowers. Dream, rabbits, dream. Stop singing and go to sleep, said the other rabbits. The rhyming rabbit felt sad and lonely. The other rabbits were all snoring, but he couldn't get to sleep. The other rabbits, the others do nothing but moan. I'm going off on my own, he said to himself, and he started to dig. He dug a long tunnel, and to keep himself going, he made up a short digging poem. Dig quick, 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 scrabble, scrabble, kick, kick. Dig, dig, quick, quick, scrabble, scrabble, kick, kick. The tunnel led him up and down and round the corner, where he met a worm. The rhyming rabbit stopped in his tracks and made up a new poem. A wonderful worm deep in the soil, why do you wiggle and curl and coil? Where are you going? Where have you been? How do you manage to say it stay so clean? How do you change your shape like that, from long and skinny to short and fat? And one more thing that's been bothering me, how can you bear to eat earth for tea? But the worm said nothing. He had no ears, so he couldn't hear the poem. 
Round the next corner, the rhyming rabbit met a mole. The mole's eyes were very small, but he did have ears. Maybe he would enjoy a spot of poetry. The rhyming rabbit stood on his hind legs and began to recite. Marvellous mole, as black as coal, with shoveling toes and a pointed nose, you shuffle around beneath the ground. You're particularly blind, but never mind. At least you can hear, so lend an ear and hear what I say. Moles rule okay. Be quiet, said the mole. I'm looking for worms. The rhyming rabbit felt very lonely, but he carried on digging. He dug and dug till he met a centipede. Straight away he thought of the best poem yet. O oh, centipede with a hundred legs, supposing you laid a hundred eggs, and supposing the baby centipedes had a hundred legs like their mum and dad, how many legs would that be? And supposing the baby centipedes grew, and they each laid a hundred eggs like you, and all of the new little sisters and brothers had just the same number of legs as the others, how many legs would that be? Shut up, said the centipede. I hate sums and doing maths. The rhyming rabbit felt sadder and lonelier than ever, and he felt hungry too. He dug his way up out of the earth and into the open air and found himself on a hill. The grass was covered in dew and tasted delicious. The rhyming rabbit ate and ate till he felt much better. Then he gazed up at the night sky and made up a new poem. O oh, midnight blue and velvet sky, O oh, silver stars so bright and high, O oh, yellow moon so clear and full that shines on trees and grass and... and... Uh... The rhyming rabbit couldn't think of a rhyme for a fool. He stopped and scratched his head... Wool, said a voice. The rhyming rabbit turned around and saw a woolly sheep standing beside him. Thank you, sheep. You, find a, you found a rhyme, he said. And the sheep replied, I make up poems all the time. Another poet, the rhyming rabbit stared in wonder. Before he could think of a rhyming reply, the sheep went on. How nice it is to meet a rabbit with whom I share my rhyming habit. The rhyming rabbit felt so happy that he had decided to make up a poem for the sheep. O oh, pretty and poetic sheep, who stands upon the hill so steep, with handsome horns and woolly fleece, as white as snow, or clouds, or... or... um... Goose! suggested the sheep. She smiled at the rabbit and added, Shall I make up a poem for you? Oh, yes, I pray you, sheep, please do, replied the rhyming rabbit. So the sheep cleared, his, cleared her throat and recited, <coughs> Any old rabbit can dig, any old rabbit can feed, but a rabbit who knows how to make up a poems is a special rabbit indeed. Any old rabbit can run, any old rabbit can sleep, but only a very special rabbit could make up poems with a sheep. The rhyming rabbit sighed happily. Ah. The sun came up. It was a beautiful day. The rhyming rabbit and the sheep stayed together all day, making up poems about the sun, the flowers and the trees. As evening fell and their shadows grew long, the rhyming rabbit remembered his family back in the burrows and said to the sheep, The others must be getting worried. Goodbye, dear friend, it's time I hurried. The sheep looked very sad and said, You go, oh no, oh woe, oh sorrow. But the rhyming rabbit replied, I will come back again tomorrow. And he did. The end. Good evening, my little superheroes. How are you doing tonight? Are you ready for bedtime? Are you ready for the adventure tomorrow? Are you ready for the bedtime story? Tonight's story is called Tiddler, the Storytelling Fish by Julia Donaldson and Axel Schaeffler. 
as you listen, can you remember what kind of fish and animals live in the sea? Once there was a fish, and his name was Tiddler. He wasn't much to look at with his plain grey scales, but Tiddler was a fish with a big imagination. He blew small bubbles, but he told tall tales. Sorry I'm late. I was riding on a seahorse. Sorry I'm late. I was flying with a ray. Sorry I'm late. I was diving with a dolphin. Tiddler told a different story every single day. At nine o'clock on Monday, Miss Skate called the register. Little Johnny Dory? Yes, Miss Skate. Rabbitfish? Yes, Miss. Redfin? Yes, Miss. Tiddler? Tiddler? Tiddler's late. Oh, sorry I'm late. I was swimming around the shipwreck. I swam into a treasure chest and someone closed the lid. I bashed and I thrashed till the mermaid let me out again. Oh, no, she didn't. Oh, yes, she did. It's only a story, said Rabbitfish to Redfin. Just a silly story, said Dragonfish to Dab. I like Tiddler's story, said little Johnny Dory, and he told it to his granny, who told it to a crab. At nine o'clock on Tuesday, Miss Skate called the register. Little Johnny Dory, yes, Miss Skate. Spiderfish, yes, Miss. Sunfish, yes, Miss. Tiddler, Tiddler. Tiddler's late. Oh, sorry I'm late, Miss. I set off really early. But on the way to school, I was captured by a squid. I wriggled and struggled till the turtle came to rescue me. Oh, no, he didn't. Oh, yes, he did. It's only a story, said Spiderfish and Sunfish. Just a silly story, said Devilfish and Dace. I love Tiddler's story, said little Johnny Dory, and he told it to his granny, who told it to a place. Who told it to a starfish? Who told it to a seal? Who told it to a lobster? Who told it to an eel? At nine o'clock on Wednesday, Tiddler was dawdling, dreaming up a story, his tallest story yet. Lost inside his story, he didn't see the fishing boat. He didn't hear the fishing men. He didn't spot the net. Meanwhile, in the schoolroom, Miss Skate called the register. Little Johnny Dory, yes, Miss Skate. Leopard fish, yes, Miss. Leaf fish, yes, Miss. Tiddler, Tiddler, Tiddler's late. Ten o'clock, eleven o'clock, still no Tiddler. Twelve o'clock, lunchtime. Where could he be? Far away, the fishermen were hauling in their fishing net. This one's just a tiddler. We'll throw him back in the sea. Tiddler were lost in the middle of the ocean, where strange lights glimmered and strange fish flew. He swam around in circles. He shivered in the seaweed. But then he heard a story, a story that he knew. Tiddler rode a seahorse. Tiddler met a mermaid. Tiddler met a turtle who saved him from a squid. Tiddler found a shipwreck. Tiddler found a treasure chest. Oh, no, he didn't. Oh, yes, he did. Tiddler peeped out, and he saw a shoal of anchovies. Excuse me, can you tell me where you heard that tale? We heard it from a shrimp, but we don't know where he, she heard it. And they took him to the shrimp who said he heard it from a whale. Who heard it from a herring? I heard it from an eel. I heard it from a lobster. I heard it from a seal. I heard it from a starfish. I heard it from a place. The place said, just a minute. I don't recognize your face. I'm Tiddler, said Tiddler. I'm tracking down my story. The place replied, oh, I heard it from my neighbor, Granny Dory. One o'clock, two o'clock, still no Tiddler. Nearly home time, where could he be? Just as the fishes were finishing their lessons. In swam Tiddler at half past three. Sorry I'm late, but I swam into a fishing net. I managed to escape and I swam away and hid. I was lost, I was scared, but a story led me home again. 
Oh, no, it didn't. Oh, yes, it did. It's just another story, said Leopard Fish and Leaf Fish. Just a silly story, said Butterfish and Blue. It isn't a story, said Little Johnny Dory. And he told it to a writer friend who wrote it down for you. The End Good evening, my little go-getters. How are you tonight? Are you ready for bed? Are you ready for a bedtime story? This story is called The Gruffalo's Child by Julia Donaldson and Axel Scheffler. Once upon a time, the Gruffalo said that no Gruffalo should ever set foot in deep dark wood. Why not? Why not? Because if you do, the big bad mouse will be after you. I met him once, said the Gruffalo. I met him a long time ago. What does he look like? Tell us, Dad. Is he terribly big and terribly bad? Oh, I can't quite remember, the Gruffalo said. Then he thought for a minute and scratched his head. Oh, the big bad mouse is terribly strong and his scaly tail is terribly long. His eyes are like pools of terrible fire and his terrible whiskers are tougher than wire. One snowy night, when the Gruffalo snored, the Gruffalo's child was feeling bored. The Gruffalo's child was feeling brave, so he tiptoed out of the Gruffalo cave. The snow fell fast and the wind blew wild. Into the woods went the Gruffalo's child. Aha! A hole! A trail in the snow! Whose is this trail, and where does it go? A tail poked out of a log pile house. Could this be the tail of the big bad mouse? Out slid the creature. His eyes were small, and he didn't have whiskers. No, none at all. You're not the mouse. Not I, said the snake. He's down by the lake. Eating Gruffalo cake. The snow fell fast and the wind blew wild. I, I'm not scared, said the Gruffalo child. Aha, oh ho, marks in the snow. Whose are these claw marks and where do they go? Two eyes gleamed out of a treetop house. Could those be the eyes of the big bed mouse? Down flew the creature. His tail was short, and he didn't have whiskers of any sort. You're not the mouse. It do not I. But he's somewhere nearby eating gruffalo pie. The snow fell fast and the wind blew wild. I'm not scared, said the gruffalo's child. Aha, a hole, a track in the snow. Whose is this track and where does it go? Whiskers at last, and an underground house. Could this be the home of the big bad mouse? Out slunk the creature. His eyes weren't fiery. His tail wasn't scaly. His whiskers weren't wiry. You're not the mouse. Oh no, not me. He's under a tree drinking gruffalo tea. It's all a trick, said the gruffalo's child, as he sat on a stump where the snow lay piled. I don't believe in the big bad mouse. But here comes a little one out of his house. Not big, not bad, but a mouse at least. You'll taste good as a midnight feast. Wait, said the mouse. Before you eat, there's a friend of mine you ought to meet. If you let me hop onto a hazel twig, I'll beckon my friends so bad and so big. The Gruffalo's child enclenched her fist. The big bad mouse, he does exist. The mouse hopped onto a hazel tree. He beckoned and then said, just wait and see. 
Out came the moon. It was bright and round. A terrible shadow fell onto the ground. Who is this creature so big, bad and strong? His tails and his whiskers are terribly long. His ears are enormous and over his shoulder he carries a nut as big as a boulder. The big bad mouse, yelled the Gruffalo's child. The mouse jumped down from the twig and smiled. Aha, oh ho, prince in the snow. Whose are these footprints and where do they go? The footprints led to the Gruffalo's cave, where the Gruffalo's child was a bit less brave. The Gruffalo's child was a bit less bored. And the Gruffalo snored and snored and snored. The End Good evening, my little dreamers. Are you ready for bed? Are you ready for a bedtime story? This story is called The Paper Dolls by Julia Donaldson and Rebecca Cobb. As you listen, I want you to remember where the paper dolls ended up at the end of the story. Once upon a time, there was once a girl who had tiger slippers and a ceiling with stars on it and a butterfly hair slide which she kept losing and two goldfish and a nice mother who helped her make some paper dolls. They were Ticky and Tacky and Jackie and Becky and Jim with two noses and Joe with a bow. And they danced and they jumped and they sang and they met a dinosaur who clawed and roared and said, I'm going to get you. But the paper dolls sang, You can't get us. Oh, no, no, no. We're holding hands and we won't let go. We're Ticky and Tacky and Jackie and Becky and Jim with two noses and Joe with a bow. And they jumped onto a bus and rode it to a farmyard and danced with the pigs. Then they lay on a rooftop and stared at the stars till a tiger slunk out of his den and he crouched and snarled and said, I'll leap up and catch you. But the paper dolls sang, You can't catch us, oh no, no, no. We're holding hands and we won't let go. We're Ticky and Tacky and Jackie and Backy and Jim with two noses and Joe with a bow. And they floated down the stairs and they danced around the honeypot and they kicked crumbs and explored an island till a fierce crocodile grinned his grin and gnashed his teeth and said, I'm coming to crunch you. But the paper dolls laughed and sang, You can't crunch us, oh no, no, no. We're holding hands and we won't let go. We're Ticky and Tacky and Jacky and Backy and Jim with two noses and Joe with a bow. And they hopped into the garden and they sniffed the flowers and they chatted to a ladybug and they lay down in a forest of grass. But along came a boy with a pair of scissors and he said, I'll snip you. And he did. He snipped them up into tiny pieces and he said, You're gone forever. But the paper doll sang, We're not gone. Oh, no, no, no. We're holding hands and we won't let go. We're Ticky and Tacky and Jacky and Backy and Jim with two noses and Joe with a bow. And the pieces all joined together. And the paper dolls flew into the little girl's memory where they found white mice and fireworks and a starfish soap and a kind granny and the butterfly hair slides and more and more lovely things each day, each week, each year. And the girl grew into a mother who helped her own little girl make some paper dolls. They were Poppy and Pinky and Binky and Blinky and Fred with one eyebrow and Flo with a bow. And they jumped and they danced and they sang. The End <laughs>